<laughs> what is going on, everybody? It's so good to be here. Thanks, Ruben, for that amazing intro. He is one of my best friends, and I love that guy. And I'm so excited that I get to be here because not too long ago, I was actually just sitting in the very same seats you guys are sitting in right now. And so thank you for having me. I love this church. I love the project. Can you actually give it up for your pastors? Ruben, Brett, Abby. Yeah. We're very fortunate. We are very fortunate to have a church like the project here in Edmonton. And again, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the project, and I'll get into that a little bit later. But to begin, um, if we haven't met yet, I want you guys to know just recently that I've entered into my dad era, okay? I've entered into my dad era. I've got two little girls. Thank you. You know, I think that's pretty cool. Um, I see one of my girls right now. Um, Being in my dad era, okay, um, I'm learning a lot of interesting things, okay? Oh, also, by the way, I've got two girls. I've got Eliana, who is three and a half years old. Uh, my friends call her El Guy. Uh, I've got Isla, who is uh, one and a half years old. And you, my friends, you guessed it, they call her I Guy. It's a weird nickname, but we'll take it. Um, but I'm actually becoming that dad right now where I can't stop talking about them. And worse yet, I'm becoming that dad that loves to go up to random people and show them photos of my girls, okay? Just because I think they're the cutest, all right? And you don't got to worry because we're in church right now. This is my place of work. I'm not going to do that. I'm totally lying. You're totally going to see a photo of my girls. They're just, they're just the cutest. I love them. I love them. They're great. Um, And I talk about them a little bit too much because of just how much I adore them. But one thing that I don't adore about being a father is all the stupid movies you have to watch, okay? (laughs) Especially Disney movies. If you know me, you know I'm not the biggest Disney fan. If you are, I apologize. I've watched Frozen way too many times to be a fan still. But sometimes, okay, sometimes you see a movie uh, that isn't so bad, okay? And so the most recent one that my girls have been obsessed about is Encanto. Have any of you guys seen Encanto? Yeah, a couple of you guys. It's pretty good. Um, And I actually really enjoy this movie because uh, there's some pretty interesting themes in that movie. Uh, There's themes of uh, family obligation, especially growing up in a traditional Chinese household. Um, We're taught that family is over self, and so I really resonated with that. Uh, But the one theme that I kind of want to talk about is this theme of belonging. You know, the main girl, the main character of the movie, her name is Mirabelle. And she was born into this family where they have superpowers, or at least most of them have superpowers. Uh, She's got sisters. One is super strong. She can lift donkeys, lift a house. Another one, the perfect child. She can, like, talk to flowers or something like that, or, like, control flowers, I think. Um... And so she, Mirabelle, okay, is left without any power. And so she kind of gets into this feeling of not belonging, or as I like to call it, being out of place. So throughout the movie, you see her trying to fit into the family by doing a little bit more, by staying upbeat and almost creating this disillusionment of happiness. But did you know that this desire of belonging or being in the club, as I like to call it, is actually a lot like many of us. Did you know that this desire is actually given to us by God? God said in the very first book of the Bible in Genesis, he says that it is not good for man to be alone. Later on in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, he says, do not neglect meeting together. It is a God-given gift, that longing to be in community and to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. And in fact, his calling, God's calling on our lives, as we'll see tonight, is bigger than us. And so this desire to belong is a great thing, but we as humans, we pervert it. We fill it with anything but God, and and an example of this would be when Elon took over Twitter, now known as X. He got rid of the blue check mark, and if you want the blue check mark, rather than being famous or uh, your notoriety, you can pay to get that check mark. You can subscribe to Twitter for it. 
It's made him billions of dollars and all for the sake of our own uh, desire to be known. And so some of us will try and do anything to get on the team to be in the club. Think of all the different teams and all the different clubs that you have tried to fit in. Maybe it's band, maybe it's every sports team known to man, maybe it's the drama club, maybe you've done things that you're not so proud of, all for the sake of belonging. But the weird thing is that sometimes when we get in, once we get that check mark, once we get that superpower per se, we start to find our identity in those things. How many of you guys know someone that's done CrossFit before? Yeah, they won't shut up about it, right? I'm, just, I'm kidding. Or maybe they do jujitsu, okay? I'm speaking from personal experience. I'm a jujitsu guy. I've been trying to get Ruben to come train, me, train with me for, for years, but he won't do it. He loves Movadi too much. Um, What's worse, okay, is when we begin to identify with something, sometimes what we like to do is we hold others at bay for the sake of the purity of that group. And so when we are part of something, it becomes more valuable or more prestigious or more elite. We begin to almost gatekeep in order to elevate ourselves over other people. We create this kind of have and have nots. We create this hierarchy of importance based off of who we belong to, and sometimes this trickles into our church. When we look at churches through this lens of haves and have-nots, we begin to size up different churches. Like, we'll go here because we like the music. Oh, no, 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 I'll actually go here because I like the speaking better. And what happens is we become consumers and not contributors. And when I say contribute, I'm not talking about finances. I'm talking about what, how you serve the church. Because when you're a consumer, you think the church is there to serve you rather than you are there to serve the church. Let me take this one step further. What's worse is when we start to size up the people within our church. Oh, you haven't done Ruben's leadership group? Well, you're not going to know what we're talking about. Oh, you're part of the welcome team? Well, I'm a worship leader. And so we start to try to make people feel insecure. We make them feel bad for what we have and what they don't have. We begin to hold things over one another when in fact they were meant to unite us in our uniqueness. Never, Jesus never intended for us to have this elitist mindset, especially when it came to his church. So tonight we're going to be continuing our series of talks going through the book of Ephesians and I want to spend our time talking about this concept of belonging or being in the club. Last week, Abby had a great message talking about um, sitting in the beauty of the gospel, that we need to know the good news before we get good advice. And a lot of the first part of Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 10, is a bit of a recap of that. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to be starting in verse 11. And so if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. It says this, Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. So Paul, what Paul's doing is he's reminding them, like, hey, guess what? You were the have-nots. You were the ones without the blue check marks. You were the one without the superpowers. You were outside the club. If you're sitting here and you're wondering what the heck is a Gentile, okay? A Gentile is essentially just anybody that's not a Jew by ethnicity. And I'm assuming that's most of us here tonight. And so one of the big things I want to hit home tonight is the great length that Christ has gone through to invite you in. Because you have to understand, up until this point, there were two groups of people. There were the chosen people of Israel and there were the Gentiles. There were the circumcised those that bore the physical mark of belonging to God through the law, and then there were the uncircumcised, which is the Gentiles. And the Jews, okay, those that followed the law, hated the Gentiles who didn't follow the law because they were considered unclean and unholy. So I don't know about you, but have you ever sat on the sidelines looking in? Have you ever been a part of the have-nots? Because I know I have. 
Growing up, I was never the biggest, the strongest, the fastest, the tallest, the smartest. You know, my parents, their dream for me was to become a doctor. Classic Asian parents. I was nowhere near as smart as they thought I was, but thank you, mom and dad. Or my own goals of making it into the NBA. I don't know if you've noticed, I'm 5'8". Not many 5'8 people get into the NBA. And so I had this sense of inadequacy. I had this sense of um, just not being good enough. And sometimes what's worse is the people that are on the team, the people that are in the club, that are inside, they start to make you feel like the have-nots. Yo, check this out. I've got a blue check mark. Check this out. I'm, I'm in the club. And if you let that fester long enough being on the outside... You'll do anything to get in. And so verse 12, Paul continues on by saying, In those days you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God has made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. But then here comes a big but. One T, not two. Thanks for getting that. (laughs) But now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. My first point of the night is this. The world, the world will separate. The world will try to separate, but Jesus integrates. The world will try to separate, but Jesus brings us together. Jesus fills the gap. Jesus is the reason why we're able to have confidence of what happens after we die. The world wants to separate us, but Jesus brings us together. And you got to understand one thing, the context of what all of this means. Do you guys remember the Good Samaritan? you guys remember the story of the Good Samaritan? A a Jewish man was beaten and left on the side of the road, and it was a, a Samaritan man that came and helped him. That story, that parable, would have been absolutely scandalous during that time because you have to understand, the Jews hated the Samaritans. Samaritans were half-breeds. They were, they were a mixture of Jews and Gentiles, and they were considered unclean. If anyone, if any Jew decided to marry a Gentile, the day of their wedding, their family would have held a funeral for them as well, too, because they were dead to the family. That's how much they hated them. Another instance is actually found in Acts 21. Paul, the guy that wrote the letter to the church of Ephesus that we're studying tonight, He was arrested because he was thought to have brought Gentiles in to the temple. And you got to understand, the temple, okay, was quite large at that time, and there were different courtyards for the priests and then the Jews, and then there was a specific point where if you were a Gentile, you couldn't pass because you would die. And so Paul was thought to have brought people past that point, and that's why he got arrested at that time. And so even just looking at these two small examples, we kind of understand the animosity and the hatred the Jews had towards the Samaritans. But Jesus, he flips the script. He says different. The world wants to separate us, but Jesus is bringing us together. And he's bringing you and me into his club. And how we get in, how we get in is actually not by our own doing. Because Right before the section in verse 8 and 9, it says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. Jesus is the one who lets you in. Jesus is the one who lets us into the club. Verse 15 goes on to say, he did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. In other words, he made the law obsolete. Why? 
Because it was the law that separated the Jews and the Gentiles. It was the law that separated those that kept it and the people that didn't. And so what does the law have to do with us today? The law shows us that we cannot keep the law. The law shows us that we need a Savior, that we need Jesus. So when Jesus, so Jesus, he didn't come to make Jews Gentiles, and he didn't come to make the Gentiles Jews, but he came to make the Jews and Gentiles Christians, Christ followers. This is a whole new group of people, a whole new category of people that included everybody. So what I'm saying here is tonight, it doesn't matter if you're Asian, if you're African, Caucasian, Hispanic, Aboriginal, it doesn't matter. You are all welcome into Jesus' club. You're all welcome here. It goes on to say in verse 17, he brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near, meaning that those inside the club can't hold the law over those that are outside the club. We no longer can size each other up and hold ourselves above one another because it was Jesus who brought us in. And you know, sometimes I get the question like, okay, that's great, but like, what can I do? Like, what can I do to get in? What can I do to earn salvation? And to that, I say in the face of the gospel, it is blasphemy. It is blasphemy because there is nothing you can do. It'd be like this. My buddy Blair and Grant uh, ran the Ironman race earlier this year, and I got to go support them. And at the end of the race, there's something called the finisher booth, the finisher photo, where anyone that's completed the race can go and take a photo to show, hey, guess what? Look, I finished the Ironman, and they invited me in to take this photo. Now, imagine if I started taking that photo and showing everybody, yo, check this out. I I ran the Ironman. Like, I could barely run a mile without losing my breath. How can I finish the Ironman? I got in that photo not because of what I've done, but because of who I know. So if you get into heaven... It is only because you have an understanding of what God has done for you through Christ and for no other reason. Verse 19 says this, And so now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. My second point of the night is this. Jesus makes a home for us. Jesus makes a home for us. Now, this is different than the home that he's talking about in John 14 where he says, I'm going to go before you and prepare a room for you in my father's house. No, no, that's in heaven. What I'm talking about is here. The home that I'm talking about is this place right here. This community of believers, this is home. He makes a place for you to belong. And some of you sitting here tonight, maybe because of your previous experience, you have a bit of a distorted view of what church is like, because maybe when you're growing up, you were told to put on your best clothing, you're dragged to church, you sat through and fell asleep for most of the sermon, or maybe you were hurt by a previous church, I am here to tell you that it is not meant to be like that. The church was meant to be your home. It is why at Hope City and at the project, we talk so much about small groups, just like what Ruben talked about tonight. Because we are meant to do life together. Because as I meet more and more people, I hear your stories. I hear your problems. You're struggling with addictions. You can't stop smoking weed. You can't stop sleeping with your boyfriend, girlfriend. You can't stop watching porn. You can't stop drinking alcohol. You can't control your anger. And to you, I say, I'm going to cry with you. I'm going to hurt with you. I'm going to pray with you. But for you to make actual change, one, you need to change the people you're running with and the race that you're running in. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Get this. Especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. 
One of the most practical things you can do outside of knowing Jesus and pursuing a relationship with him is changing the people you're running with and the race you're running in. Meaning if you want to change your life, you need to change who you're hanging with and where you're hanging out. Now, usually when I say that, people are like, man, like, what do you mean I have to stop hanging out with them? Like, like didn't Jesus hang out with the prostitutes? Newsflash, you ain't Jesus. <laughs> Maybe if you become more like Jesus, then you can hang out with the prostitutes. But right now, you're just prostituting yourself. I might have missed it. So how do I change who I run with and the race that I'm running? This, this is how. Make this your home. Dive in to the project community. Maybe it's time you got to join Hag's newcomer group because you are new to the project community. Maybe you got to join Natalie's girls night out. Maybe you got to go to the uh, pro sports on Monday nights and just hang out with other like-minded Christians. By the grace of God, every week I get a front row seat witnessing people who dive in to this home, to this community, who grow in their knowledge and love for God, and they start to thrive. Now, does this mean that everything's fine, everything's okay? No, absolutely not. But what it means is there's contentment. There's community. There's continual growth And most importantly, there's hope. And you know, my story is actually a lot like that. Uh, Blair, who I mentioned earlier, invited me to the project 15 years ago. Oh, I'm old. He invited me here 15 years ago, and I wasn't overly religious, but I came, I saw the pretty girls, and I stayed. (laughs) So superficial, but I got to be honest, I stayed for that. And even though I was going to church, I was um, trying to, you know, make this my community, I didn't really change anything about my life. I was still hanging out with the same people doing the same thing. And so nothing changed. And it wasn't until God interrupted me where I was at and captivated my heart that it began to change. Change the people I was hanging out with and where we were hanging out. The relationship and mentors that I've built throughout all these years of making this church my home is the reason I'm able to stand here today. And so my hope for you is that not only do you feel at home at the project, but you also make it your home. Paul continues in verse 20, together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. My last point of the night is this. Jesus makes a home for us. Jesus makes a home out of us. Jesus and his teachings are the foundation in which we are built upon. And if you've ever built a home or built anything from the ground up, you know how important a foundation is. It's a lesson I was reminded of recently when my neighbor paid thousands of dollars for someone to come reinforce his foundation because uh, roots from a tree were threatening to collapse his home. Foundations matter. And I love that, you know, Jesus says his temple is built on him. He is the foundation. And I love that he uses the illustration of a cornerstone. Because a cornerstone is the first stone that you would put down when you're building any house, any structure during this time period. It's a perfectly shaped stone, 45 degrees on all sides. And it had to be that way because all the other stones and bricks were stacked on top based on that cornerstone. Every stone, every brick that you laid down, you had to look at the cornerstone because that is the foundation in which 
this whole building is built upon. Jesus' temple is a beautiful mosaic of all types of people, of all kinds of people. So whether you're tall or you're short, you're gifted, you're not so gifted, you're a little crazy, you're a little goofy, you're funny, his temple is a collection of all kinds of people. And this temple, it actually can't be built by myself. It can't just be built by one brick. It requires brick and stone, brick and stone, built on top of each other. And it's this beautiful picture that God uses, that Jesus uses this to tell us, hey, guess what? I need all of you. I need all of you. And it's a beautiful picture that when we come together, we are much stronger. And isn't that a plot that we've seen time and time again? Like, think of your favorite movie. Like, mine is Avengers Endgame. Imagine, like, Captain America standing in front of, like, Thanos and his whole army, and he's by there by himself. Like, he'd get crushed if it was just him. But then the Avengers come, and he does a whole Avengers assemble, and then they, have, they duke it out, and he wins. Okay, let, let me dumb it down a little bit. How about Paw Patrol? <laughs> Ryder can't do anything on his own. He can't solve any mystery. He can't fix any problems if it wasn't for the Paw Patrol. Let's bring it back to the Bible. King Solomon in Ecclesiastes says, a cord of three strand is not easily broken, meaning... We are stronger together. And God said he needs all of us to contribute. The body, okay, this body, this church, this temple is better when everyone contributes. But here's the thing. Some of you guys are sitting on the sideline. You're sitting on the sideline. You're not playing a role. You've got courtside seats. And what I'm saying is you got to get in the game. Because this church needs you. Edmonton needs you. Have you looked around lately? There's so much brokenness in our city. And I believe that it is the local church that is the hope and the future of our city. God wants to use you. And here's the thing. There's an enemy out there that wants you to stay on the sideline. He wants you to stay inactive. And for some, he's actually winning. You're listening to him. You're staying inactive. You're not getting in the game. But thank God for his grace and his mercy because he takes all of us in our uniqueness and in our different strengths. The world will say many things to you. The world will tell you you're weird. God says you're his. The the world has rejected me. God has accepted you. The world says I can't. God says you can. The world says you are alone. You will never amount to anything. You will never make a difference. God says watch. Watch what I can do through you. My worry is that some of you guys are actually really gifted. You are. You're more gifted than me. You're more gifted than Reuben but you're doing nothing with the gifts that God has given you. To whom much is given, much is expected. So my question to you is, what are you doing with what is given to you? What is your role? We talked about small groups earlier. Maybe your next is actually to lead a small group in the fall. Maybe you need to join the hosting team and be a greeter at the front doors. Maybe you need to go hand out food to the homeless with Matt on a Sunday afternoon. Let me ask you this again. What is your role? Interestingly enough, the verse that precedes this section that we've been looking at is verse 10. And it says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So what is your role? What are you doing? And I want to just dial it back a little bit and take a look at this word masterpiece. 
Now, when you hear that word, you might be looking to your buddy and be like, masterpiece? This guy's a piece of work, but he's no masterpiece. Or maybe some of you guys are th- thinking like, masterpiece? Like, I don't feel it. I look in the mirror, and that's not what I see. And to you, I say, you are not the artist. You are not the artist. The artist reserves the right to say what he wants to about his work, regardless of how you feel. Let me say that again. The artist reserves the right to say what he wants about his work, regardless of how you feel. God He has declared you his masterpiece. He has declared you his masterpiece. Now, artsy people, if you're artsy, I'm not. When you look at a blank canvas, all I see is paper. But the artsy people, they'll say, oh, this is an unfinished masterpiece. Or maybe you're a musician. Musician, they'll hear sounds. They hear different clinks and all that stuff. And when they put it together, it becomes this beautiful piece of music God sees you and knows you're not done. And he's declaring you that you are his masterpiece. Think of Peter. He denied Jesus three times. What happened? He became the first leader of the Christian church. It took him a while to grow into his gifting and calling. So some of you guys right now may be looking in the mirror and think you're a failure, you're an addict, you're a coward, or whatever label you think you have. But God sees an unfinished masterpiece. And there hasn't been a piece that God has thrown away. Philippians 1, 6 says, And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. You see a blank canvas, God sees a masterpiece. In closing, I want to ask you guys two questions. And I truly believe that these two questions actually encapsulate everything that we've been talking about. And these are questions that Paul, this guy that wrote uh, a lot of the New Testament, especially Ephesians, okay, he himself asked when he was on the road to Damascus. If you want to know more about that, just head to Acts chapter 22. The first question is this, who are you, Lord? If you are a Christian, you most likely have asked that question and received an answer. But if you consider yourself, you're curious about the Christian faith or you're still kind of on the fence about it, I want to challenge you to ask that question tonight because I truly believe you will receive an answer. Second question is this, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do, Lord? I think it is one of the most important questions any young adult can ever ask because it's not what I want to do or what my family wants me to do, but what do you want me to do, Lord? And one of the biggest questions I think young adults have is finding the answer to why am I here? What is the purpose of my life? And I truly believe you will not find an answer apart from God. So what do you want me to do, Lord? As we enter into this time of worship, I just want to invite you to ask those questions. He says, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. So seek, ask, knock. We're going to have the prayer team come up as well too. Like I said earlier, this is your home. This is your community. You don't have to do this by yourself. You can come, you can ask for prayer, you can seek counsel from your pastors. You don't have to do this alone. Why don't you join me as we close in prayer? Father, I just pray for each and every single soul in this building tonight. I pray that as they're as their heart and as their soul yearns for what is their purpose, what is their meaning, God, I pray that they seek nowhere else but from you. And Lord, as the world tries to separate us, I pray that you remind all of us here tonight that you integrate, that you bring us together. 
that nothing the world can offer will replace what the church is and can be. And I pray that this home that you have made for us, I pray that we dive into this community. And as you make a home out of us, may we be your ambassadors of your truth, of your love and your grace to a broken world. And so I pray for all my friends here tonight. May you bless them. May you anoint them. May you keep them. And may they experience the powerful, miraculous, wonderful presence of your spirit. We pray all these things in your name, God. Amen.